Yeah, truly. Put the hand sanitizer. Hey, good morning, church family. All right. A little reverby. Oh, yeah, because I'm using the vocalist mic today. Hey, well, it's good to have you here with us this morning. This is our last Sunday outdoors, so we are going to uh, go out big. We're going to be doing Lord's Supper today, uh, celebrating. Got the big worship team up here today. Got a great message. Going to hear from God's Word. Lots of opportunity to worship today in spirit and in truth. So as I mentioned, we will be doing Lord's Supper today, so I thought it appropriate that we open with a scripture that has to do with Um, the Lord's Supper. If you would, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is from Isaiah 53. Isaiah talking about Jesus Christ, who at that time was to come. He says this in verse 5, and I'm going to jump ahead to the end. It's Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquity. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we, brothers and sisters, are healed. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many be accounted righteous. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done. Lord, what you're doing and what you're going to do. Jesus, we're here to worship Almighty God, we are here to worship you. May we do so now in spirit and in truth for the glory of God. We pray these things in Jesus' sweet name. Amen. Well, amen. If you did not get a lyric sheet coming in uh, when you came in, I want to encourage you to grab one of those so you can sing along. Also, the uh, lyrics are on our website at countryoaks.org. There's a little link there. It says links and lyrics. If you click that, it'll pull up today's lyrics. Let's worship together, uh, singing of our identity in Christ.
So sing again, I'm chosen, not forsaken. see these truths together from Romans 9. We turn from God. We had turned from God to sin's disgrace. We chose the path to hell. Perfect law of God condemned our race. For all in Adam fell. But the righteousness of God appeared in the world found This one has come down to bear all the curse of sin and death. Now to him who seated on the throne, all glory be forever. All the depths of wisdom, grace, and power, all glory be forever. And all glory be See every bond of sin, every bond of sin that held me fast is left in Jesus' grave. We've been freed from all that gripped our past, from Satan's rule and reign. We've been raised to life to breathe His grace, as captives now we claim. All our guilt is gone, all our shining seas, we're alive to seek His grace. holds. We know that God holds our future. And he has fixed it. And he is working for our good and his glory. Let's sing, now our future's fixed. Now our future's fixed, our journey clear. God will not let us go. Every trial that tempts our hearts to fear to give us hope all creation comes as we Oh, God, may be forever, all the depths 
the depths of wisdom, grace and power All glory be forever And all glory be forever All glory be forever We'll sing now the work that Jesus Christ has done. The song is called I Got Saved. I got some flack from the band about the grammar, but I think that it's a, a good sentiment, so we're going to stick with it. from Emmanuel's veins The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and got saved Since then I walk in forgiveness All of my guilt was erased The chains of the past are broken at last I got saved Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. I couldn't want more. Nothing but goodness I've tested and tasted your grace And I was so lost And I fell at the cross And got saved Oh, I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I've got Jesus I could have won more I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord I'm restored and made right He got a hold I could have won more. I've got Jesus. I could have won more. I've got Jesus. I could have won more. God, I pray that you would restore to us the joy of our salvation. God, that when we think about the cross, the work that you did there. God, I pray that we'd be undone, we'd be undone by the mercy of Jesus. 
that it would never become something routine or rote. But you would continually, day after day, impress to us the seriousness, the importance, and the joy of the cross. We love you, Lord. Praise in your name. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Good morning. I'm, a, I'm on. It's a beautiful morning this morning. Welcome to Tehachapi, a little wind. We do call these sails, so we'll see what happens <laughs> as we get going. Uh, we're going to take the Lord's Supper right now, and um, if you're uh, uh, new to the church or new to Christianity, the Lord's Supper really does two things. It points back to what Christ did for us on the cross, dying for our sins as a sacrifice um, so that those that put their faith in him wouldn't have to pay the penalty that they earned, but instead we get looked upon as if we lived Christ's life. It remembers what Christ did on the cross. It also points forward. It anticipates our fellowship we will have in eternity as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And so we're going to take the Lord's Supper this morning. I would ask if you aren't a Christian this morning or if you don't know where you stand with the Lord, if you just question where you're at, don't take the Lord's Supper this morning. Um, have come talk with me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about what the Lord's Supper is and what the gospel is. Um, but if you would, just not uh, take the Lord's Supper. We're going to do what we have done, and that is if we can get one representative from each family to walk up. There's tables in the back, and there's tables up here to grab as many of the elements as you need. There's just one uh, container that you can uh, need to grab uh, for your family. Um, we're going to do that right now. So if you would stand up and go grab what you need to grab, that'd be great. Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should give His only Son To make the rich His treasure want to remind you that the, this has uh, two parts. If you open up the first part, the bread will pop out. I'm going to be reading from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, The Lord, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In 
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for your death on the cross, Lord, as we sing that our sins are forgiven, that, that you were raised on the third day, Lord, and that uh, one day we will be with you in eternity, Lord. I pray that this is a celebration of anticipation of the fellowship we will have with you and with each other forever. Be with us this morning, Lord, as we continue to worship you. In your son's name, amen. Uh, my name is Ross Amato with the pastoral team, and um, we have the, the privilege this morning to come before the Lord and lift up um, what's going on with the, the Supreme Court. So I would love to ask you to, to join me in prayer um, as we, we lift up what God is doing in that situation. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, we praise you for this morning. We praise you for gathering here together as your children, Lord, and and coming before you and and coming to our knees and asking, Lord, that uh, your will and your timing would be done, Lord. We praise you for what you've done for this nation, Lord, the, the men, the founders that had the wisdom that you gave them, Lord, to implement a system where your justice can be issued out on earth, Lord. And we praise you for all the men and women that have served to protect and to fight for that freedom, Lord, that we enjoy. Lord, I just implore you that you would turn the hearts of your people, turn the hearts of those who don't know you, Lord, to to appoint and confirm a person, Lord, and in this case it looks as though it may be a woman, Lord, that you have chosen to seek your will and seek your heart, Lord, and issue justice in a way that glorifies you. Lord, we, we ask forgiveness for our misunderstanding of what justice truly is, Lord, that that so many people don't even understand what that word means, Lord, that they chant for it on the streets and we cry out for it, Lord, and it's not vengeance and it's not pain back, Lord, it's what we deserve, Lord, and as sinful human beings, we deserve eternity separated from you and eternal punishment in hell, Lord, that is justice. And you are completely just And we praise you for that, Lord. I pray that you would have this Supreme Court be full of men and women that understand that, Lord, that understand what justice and truth is. Lord, and we also praise you that not only are you 100% just, but you are also 100% merciful. And we don't get what we deserve if we call you Lord and we are your children, Lord. And what you did for us on the cross 2,000 years ago has paid for that, what we deserve. That justice was paid by your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. And I just ask for opportunities as your people to share that, to pour that into the culture around us, Lord. We thank you for this glimpse of of hope, Lord, that we could have someone on this court that would turn the tide, Lord, that would reverse the evils that have been done for so many years, Lord, that would abolish abortion in our nation, Lord, and would maintain freedom and all the wonderful things that we see the potential of these men and women being able to do, Lord. But ultimately, our hope and our trust is in you, Lord, that you are just and you are merciful, and we just praise you for that this morning. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen.
Hello, there we are. So I think there's a 50-50 shot that one of these is going to blow away by the time this sermon is over with. So if you would hold on to them, that'd be, you know, hopefully it's not this one. If you would, turn to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15, and I know what you're thinking. I thought we were in Ephesians. Yes, we are. We'll be back in Ephesians next week, and some of you are thinking we're never going to get through Ephesians. We will, uh, Lord willing, unless he comes back before we're done. Um, the reason we're in Hebrews, actually, is uh, I've never done this before. Tuesday, I heard a sermon on Hebrews 10, verse 25, and I just felt like our, our church needed to hear this passage. Not necessarily the sermon I heard, but this passage of Scripture. We needed to hear from it, especially as we are planning on meeting inside next week. So if you would, follow along with me. Ephesians chapter 10, verse 19 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confidence of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as a habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. If you would, pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I just pray, Lord, that the words, the truth that are in this passage are heard. Lord, that I get out of the way of what you have to say this morning. Lord, be with us as a church, as we so desire fellowship, as we so desire to be together, Lord. Help us to be a testimony of you, a trinity, a community, a God that's three in one, Lord, perfect love from eternity past. Help us display that as a church, Lord. Be with us this morning as we go over this passage in your son's name. Amen. You know, nine months ago, before this COVID thing hit, if you would ask me what I thought the biggest threat to the church in America was, I'm pretty sure I would have answered the lack of de uh, devotion to the local church. The lack of devotion to fellowship or to gathering as a church. You know, I heard a stat last week that really just scared me. I know God's in control. He's sovereign. But when this is all over, the stat I heard, and of course this is a guess, when this is all over, in other words, when COVID is gone, it's behind us, the stat said that 20% of the church won't come back. It means the church will be 20% smaller than it was before COVID. So today I want to look at the importance of the gathered. Of the good news is the second point, and the third point is the implication. The good news, the command in light of the good news, and the implication. The first two points of this sermon actually are really just context of verse 25, which says, not neglecting to meet together. So let's start with the first point, the good news. Look at Hebrews 10, 19. It says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, the author here of Hebrews is telling his brothers two things. Two New Testament truths. The first one is found in verse 19. It says, Therefore, brothers, since, since we, New Testament believers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, we can confidently enter the holy places because of the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. We can confidently stand in the presence of God because Jesus is our sacrifice. Look at verse 19 again. Therefore, brothers, since, this is the first truth, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, through Christ, in other words, we have access to God. That's exactly what Jesus has told us. He said, no one comes to the Father except through me. 
John 14, 6. Not only that, look at verse 21. It says this, and since, this is the second New Testament truth, and since we have a great high priest or great priest over the house of God, Jesus, in other words, is not only our sacrifice, but he's also our great priest, our high priest, who intercedes for us. In fact, if you're a Christian this morning, he's interceding for you right now. The author is saying because of these, these great truths, because of the good news, because of the gospel, Brothers, live this way. And he gives us three commands in verses 22 through 24. Three ways to live in light of the gospel. Three commands. Because of the gospel, look at verse 22. It says this, because of the gospel, let us draw near. Verse 23, look at verse 23. Let us hold fast. And verse 24, let us consider. Look again, verse 22 says this, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Look at verse 23. It says, let us hold fast the, co or the confession of our hope. And then look at verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love. Faith, hope, and love. These are the three lasting virtues of the Christian faith, right? Faith, hope, and love. Because of the gospels, Christians, in other words, should be marked by faith, hope, and love. And this is a truth. It's not a truth just in Hebrews. It's a truth throughout all of the New Testament, especially. Look at, or you don't, let me just listen to these passages as I go through. Colossians 1 verse 3 says this, we give thanks to God, the Father of Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints and because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. We have faith, love, and hope. 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 says this, We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention to you in our prayers, consistently bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 8, it says, But since we, have, since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet of hope of salvation. Again, faith, love, and hope. And then 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, verse 12 says this, For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. This is talking about heaven when we will be face to face with God. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now in this life, in other words, faith, hope, and love abide in these three. But the greatest of these is love. Faith, hope, and love, three marks of the Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians 13, 13, it says, abide in these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why is love the greatest? Because it's the internal virtue. One commentator said this, and I think he just put it in a good way, the object of our faith and hope will be fulfilled and perfectly realized in heaven. Right? Faith will be replaced by sight when we're in heaven. Hope will be replaced by reality when we're in heaven. But love, the godlike virtue, is eternal. It's everlasting. Heaven will be the place for the, the expression of nothing but perfect love towards God and each other forever. Heaven will be worship of God in love forever and fellowship with one another in love forever. It will be vertical love, love of God. It will be horizontal love, love of each other forever. Heaven is fellowship. And it's not surprising because God is a God of fellowship. He's a God of community. He's a trinity. It will be fellowship with God for eternity, and it will be fellowship with one another for eternity. You know what this means? Our shared love, our shared fellowship, our shared worship that we have Sunday mornings is the closest experience to heaven we have on earth. What happens Sunday morning in the local church, this, this anticipates eternity. 
Look at verse 22 again. It says this, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope and let us, let us, verse 24, let us, or let us consider how to stir up one another to love. Right? These three commands in light of the gospel, I want to look at the one command, the last command. It's my second point, the command in light of the good news. I want to focus on verse 24, which says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love. The command actually is interesting. It's let us consider. The Greek word for consider there is katanuo, which means to give very, very careful consideration to a matter, to think about very carefully, to consider closely. It's in the present tense in Greek. That's more the aspect that's important. It's, it's a continuous aspect. In other words, it's a continuous action that keeps going. Let us continually consider, think carefully, intentionally thinking how to stir up one another to love, in other words. One another, of course, this is talking about the church. The word to stir up is actually a very interesting word. In the Greek, it's usually a negative term. It's usually translated something like to incite or to irritate, to exasperate or to stimulate, or probably the best translation, to provoke. It's meant to be a provocative term. The author wanted to shock the reader as he comes across this word. It's only used twice in the New Testament here and then Acts 15, 39, which says, and there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. It's used a few times in the Septuagint, which if you don't know what that is, that's just the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It's a translation that Jesus and the apostles used. People would have been familiar with this. And I think there's one use that's very helpful to get the connotation that's going on in Hebrews, and that's Proverbs 27, 12. As iron sharpens iron. That word sharpens the same exact word that's used to stir up. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Listen, we as a body were meant to sharpen one another. As iron sharpens iron. Our fellowship is a means of grace. God uses it to do two things. To preserve and to grow. To preserve our salvation and to grow us more like Christ. Christian fellowship is so extremely important. It's what the author, I believe, is trying to say in verse 24. Brothers, he says... Because of this good news, take fellowship seriously. This is important. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Because of the gospel, we as Christians, in other words, should be constantly considering, thinking about how we can stir each other up, how we can sharpen each other to love and good works. How? How? How are we to do this? Well, I, I just thought real quickly, seven ways we can do this. Seven ways we stir each other up, that we sharpen each other. Stir each other up, one another up to love and good works. The first way I thought of was we can stir up one another, we can sharpen each other by practicing the ordinances together. We just did that this morning. Lord's Supper and Baptism. In 1 Corinthians 11, which I read through, it says, it says this in verse 20, when you come together. In other words, it's assumed, Paul's, Paul's, Paul assumes the church will, will come together. And the verse 24 says this, do this, the Lord's Supper and other, in remembrance of me. Communion reminds us of what Christ has done for us. It's an encouragement that we're forgiven. An anticipation of eternity. Another way we can stir each other up is by reading, teaching, preaching God's word to each other. 1 Timothy 4.13, it says, Until I come, devote yourself, Paul is telling Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. In 2 Timothy 4.2, it says this, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reproof, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. A third way we can stir each other up is by, by singing with each other. Ephesians 5.18, we went over this recently. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, 
but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's amazing. Verse 19 says, addressing one another. Of course we worship God and we sing to God, but we also sing to each other to encourage each other. Isn't worshiping together encouraging? You know, I think it's what I miss most when we weren't meeting together. It's just having the body together, worshiping together, singing truths to God and to one another. You know, what's interesting is that I've had a number of people come up to me from out of town and just say thank you, almost in tears. Thank you. Thank you for meeting. I haven't gone to church in six months. No one around my area is meeting together. A fourth way we can stir each other up is by praying for one another. Ephesians 5, 16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it's working. A fifth way we can stir each other up is by confronting each other, by keeping each other accountable when we see sins. Matthew 18, 15 says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. In other words, God has used you as a means of grace in someone's life. A sixth way we can stir each other up is by just speaking encouraging words to each other, to one another. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. A seventh way we could stir each other up is by using our gifts to serve one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 says, Now there are a variety of gifts and the same Spirit, and there are a variety of services but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities but the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. That's a spiritual gift for the common good. We each have been given a gift to serve one another. These are the things we do to stir up one another to love and good works. In other words, it's this. It's what we're doing right now. Sunday mornings, it's small groups when we get together. Right? We sing together. We, we practice as the sacraments together. We read, we teach, we preach God's word. We pray for one another. We speak encouraging words to each other. We use our gifts to serve one another. That's why this coming together is so important. I want you to think about this. Remember there's three virtues that are talked about. Three commands. Verse 22, verse 23, verse 24. Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Verse 23, let us hold fast fast to the confession of our hope. That's faith, hope. And then verse 24, let us consider how to stir up one another to love. We have faith, hope, and love. This is all over the New Testament. When you think about this, love is the only one you can't practice alone. For us to love, we need each other. Faith and hope are personal. You can have a personal faith. You can have a personal hope. You can't have a personal love. You can't be marked by love if you're isolated, if you're alone. We need each other to love. Donald Gunthry writes, the New Testament lends no support to the idea of a lone Christian. Close and regular fellowship with other believers is not just a nice idea but an absolutely, absolute necessity for the encouragement of Christian values. We need each other to love. And listen, this is all the context of verse 25. Not neglecting to meet together. Here's the point. We can't stir up 
one another to love and good works if we don't meet together. So it leads to the third point, the implication. Look at verse 24 again. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. Verse 25, not neglecting to meet together, really is just a logical implication of love. It's a logical implication to the command before that to consider how to stir up one another to love. Again, we can't stir up one another to love and good works if we don't meet each other. If we don't fellowship with each other. Christians should be marked by faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love, according to 1 Corinthians 13. Our greatest virtue is love. That's why we meet. I want you to see how important fellowship is. If you would, turn to Hebrews 3.12. It's not the first time the author has written about our fellowship and how important it is that we encourage each other. Hebrews 3.12 says this. If you turn there, it's too much wind. I can't hear your Bibles going, so I don't know when you get there or not. So let me just assume you're all there. Hebrews 3.12 says this. Take care, brothers, less. This is a warning. Just listen to that. This is a warning. Brothers, take care, lest, I'm warning you, lest there be any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. That's a very serious warning. Be careful lest you fall away from the living God with an evil, unbelieving heart. There's eternal consequences to this warning. Verse 13, but... Right? This is one of the ways God preserves our faith, in other words. Verse 13, but exhort, that means encourage one another every day as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Our meeting together, our encouraging one another has eternal consequences. It's one of the ways God stops a hardening of a heart. It's one of the ways God preserves our salvation, in other words. Verse 13, but exhort one another every day. Why every day? Because every day we face lies. It says the deceitfulness of sin. We face lies. We face lies on TV, on social media. We face lies at work. We face lies that come from our own deceitful hearts. There's lies everywhere. We need to be encouraging each other to not listen to these lies. Verse 13, again, it says, exhort one another every day as long as it's called today. That's why small groups are so important. It's why encouraging text messages are so important. It's why encouraging phone calls and emails and letters. It's why encouraging words to your husbands and wives. It's why encouraging words to your children are so important. Why our fellowship is so important. Our fellowship is a means of grace. Now turn back to Hebrews 10, verse 25. Again, verse 25 says, not neglecting to meet together. You know, what's interesting, I don't think any translation translates it this way, but in Greek, the word meet is actually a noun. And it's articular, meaning it has an article, it has a the before it. So a better translation would just be not neglecting the meeting. Well, what's the meeting? Well, we learn in Acts, the very first church met every single day, but later on in Acts, they came together in, in particular one day a week on the Lord's Day on Sunday and met together and worshiped together. It's probably what this is talking about. Not neglecting to meet together, the meeting together as the habit of some. Who are the some? I don't know. But if you look at the context of this passage, it's probably people that were afraid of being persecuted by associating with Christians, and so they said, hey, we're just not going to meet. Whoever they are, it's clear in verse 26 and 27 that they didn't just walk away from the local church. But they also walked away from the faith altogether. Hebrews makes it clear that our fellowship has eternal weight. In fact, 1 John 2.19 says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. 
For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. You know, I think about that when I hear the stat that 20% won't come back to the church. 20% won't come back to the church. Our fellowship, our meeting together is so important. Turn with me to Acts 2, verse 41. Acts 2, verse 41. A lot of us are familiar with this passage. It's the first church. And just so you know, it was a Baptist church. It says, so they were, received the word and were baptized. I'm telling you, it's a Baptist church. Verse 40, 41, it says this, So they received the word and were baptized, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And the church was 3,000 like that, a beautiful church, the first church. In verse 42, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. That's awesome. I mean, think about that. It doesn't get any better than that. The apostles taught this church, and they spoke authoritatively. In other words, when they spoke, they spoke Scripture. Meaning, this church was devoted to Scripture. But they weren't just devoted to Scripture. Look what it says in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. They were devoted to the fellowship. I mean, think about that. The very next thing to the apostles' teaching, which is Scripture, was they were devoted to the fellowship. The church was devoted to the apostles' teachings and, and the, the fellowship. To the breaking of bread and the prayers. Verse 43, and awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. They were together. And had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. In other words, there was this deep love for each other, for one another, and they were, they were selling their stuff if they had to to support one another. And you're like, well, we're not supposed to do that. You know, I see that in this church. I've seen people just give cars away to other people that were in need. I mean, it's funny, as, as a pastor, I get to see the behind the scenes. I just wish we could make it public. But every time someone does something like that, they say, hey, I don't want to be known. It's beautiful, the love this church has for each other. And, and I, I see it in our church. Verse 45, and they were selling the proceeds and belongings and distributing them to all any that had need, verse 46, and day to day attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. We ask the question, where do they meet? You know, most people answer this question in homes, which is true. It says right there, they met in each other's homes. A lot of people use this to say we were never meant to, to meet in a building. We should be just meeting in each other's homes and home churches the way that was intended, the first church did. But that's not true. Look at verse 46 again. It says this, And day to day, attending the temple together. Well, what's the temple? A big building. Big enough to hold 3,000 people so they can come together and worship together as one body. You know what they did too? They went into each other's homes. What's that sound like? Church. We come together as a large building or outside. We meet together, we worship together, and then throughout the week we meet in each other's homes. We call them growth groups here at our church. Sunday morning we worship on the Lord's Day. That's what the church did in Acts. They met together as a large group until persecution got so heavy that they couldn't meet in public. And during the week they met in each other's homes and small groups, and growth groups, and just fellowshipping each other, just loving each other. They're a big family. Look at verse 46 again. And day to, by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, 
Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the peoples. And the Lord added their number day by day, those who are being saved. Listen, our fellowship together as a church is a witness to the community. We've said this time and time again. In fact, John 13, 35 says, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. You know, during the lockdown, there was people struggling. As a pastor, I saw it. People struggling inside the church and people struggling outside the church. Families struggling. Domestic violence was on the rise. We saw that everywhere, right? I mean, and the stats. Alcoholism was, was skyrocketing. Suicide. And of course, the state closed down the church but kept open liquor stores, pop shots, or pot shops, and abortion clinics as essential businesses. You know, I'm not shocked that after you, you closed down the church for months that, that the society ended in riots. You know what was crazy during the lockdown? I've told a number of people this. I called the police twice. I've never called the police in my life. I witnessed domestic violence right in front of my eyes twice and had to call the police. There was one night during the lockdown, I witnessed an ugly argument between a man and a woman that went on for hours, and I called the cops and just said, hey, look, I haven't seen a crime, but I don't want to. Could you come? When it was over, the woman took off, and the man was sitting out on the porch, and I got this conviction. You can call the cops on the guy, but you're not going to go over there and talk to him, right? So I went over there, and talked to him and asked if I could pray for him. The first thing he said is, I don't believe in God. But, kind of softened, he looked at me, he's like, he said this, I wasn't expecting anyone to be kind to me today. So if you want to pray, I'd let you pray for me. So I prayed and shared the gospel with him. He said, thanks. He said, but I just don't believe in God. I said, that's good. That's fine. Like, he's there. He loves you, man. You can turn to him. And then he talked to me for like an hour. And I just sat and listened the very end of the conversation I had with this man, he asked me what church I went to. I said, Country Oaks. Usually don't tell people I'm the pastor. I just say, I go there. He said, I really would like to come to church with you one day. And I asked why. I'm like, that's weird. You just said you don't believe in God. Why would you, you know, my focus was the gospel. I didn't, you know, come to church or not. You have more important issues to deal with. He said, I really would like to come to church with you today. You don't believe in God. He says, I know, but the community you have, I envy that. I see the love the church has for itself. I want to be a part of that. Our fellowship is a witness. Look at verse 46 again. It says this, And day to day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. By this, Jesus says, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now turn back to Hebrews 10. Verse 24. Hebrews 10, verse 24. It says this in verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. You know, the day that's talked about here, of course, is Jesus' second coming. It's the end, right? Let me ask the question. I want you to raise your hand. How many of you are convinced the day is drawing near? Okay, let me, let me put your hands up. Let me ask another question. How many of you are more convinced this year, 2020, that the day is drawing near than you were a year ago? Let me ask the third question. Are we closer to that day than the first church in Acts 2 was 2,000 years ago? Yeah. 
Yet most Christians act like meeting together is optional. It's not important. It's not a command. You know, and this is just even before COVID. Right? The church was not a high priority. Look, I'm not trying to make people feel guilty. If you're watching online and you have a health condition and that's what's keeping you away from the body, but you were consistently coming to church up to that point, the goal is not to make you feel guilty. We will try to, to help you be a part of the fellowship the best we can as a church. But this is a command. Look at it again, Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We as a church need to make meeting together a priority. Right? The church is called to meet together. Acts 2, we just went over that. The church met together daily in each other's homes in the temple in a large building together. The church, ecclesia, in Greek means assembly, the gathering. It's what we do. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, the Lord's Supper, we just went over that. It says, when you come together, it's just assume the church would be together. Why this sermon? And I know we went long this morning, but I think it's important. Next week, we're going inside. We're going to have two services, 8.30 and 10.30. The only difference that's going to be there is it's going to be 8.30 instead of 10.30 or 9. Now you're all confused. 8.30 and 10.30 are the two services. It used to be 9. It's going to be 8.30 now. And the reason we're doing that is so we can fellowship between the services. So we're not rushed. We have time to hang out and see each other. So first service church and second service church can be one church and say hi to each other. We're going to have Sunday school. We're going to have ABFs. I think we'll probably even have donuts. We're going to do this because we desperately need fellowship. We desperately need each other. We desperately need to encourage one another. There's two things I ask, and it's what we've been asking. First, if you're sick, just stay home. If you've been around someone that's sick, stay home. Get better and then come. Second, again, if you have health conditions, you don't feel comfortable coming, we will live stream both services still. You might be asking, is this going to go against the state guidelines? The answer, honestly, is yes. And my response to that is the same as Peter in Acts 5.29. We must obey God rather than man. It's clear biblically, and I've talked about this, that the state has authority, and we should submit as Christian to that authority that's been placed there by God. But the state does not have authority over the church. Only Christ has authority over the church. The state answers to God. The church answers to God. And families answer to God. Three institutions established by God. Even though we want to respect, honor, and pray just like we did this morning, our state government and our, our country, our federal government, even though we have tried our best to be submissive to their requests, at some point, and we as an elder board, and I feel we as a church, say it's now. The church needs to make a stand and say, this this is too important to compromise on. We answer to God, not man, not the state. We must obey God rather than man. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for the church. I thank you in particularly the local church, Country Oaks, Lord. I love this church. I thank you for the love I see of one another in this church and that I have seen. I thank you for the desire of my brothers and sisters who want to be obedient to you, Lord. God, give us courage as a church to make fellowship, to make meeting together a priority. 
Lord, I pray that you protect us, that you're with us, Lord. God, give us a deep love for one another, Lord. And I pray that deep love, Lord, is a witness to our community. In your son's name, amen. Well, amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing together. strength within sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our way sanctifying us when beyond our understanding you're teaching us to trust your plan still and prosper you have not forgotten us you with this in the fire and the blood you're faithful forever perfect in love you are sovereign over us see his wisdom unimagined you are wisdom unimagined Who could understand your ways? Any high above the heavens, reaching down in endless grace. You're the lifter of the lowly. Passionate and kind You surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the blood you're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over Rest in your sovereignty this morning, God. Yeah. Let's sing together, church. You know what the enemy means for evil. You know what the enemy means for evil. You turn it for our good. 
you turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good, for your glory. Even what the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for my good. You're working for our good. And for your glory, your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire. In the flood, you're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Your plans are to prosper. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire. In the flood. Perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. You're faithful forever. Perfect in love, you are sovereign over God, we thank you that you are faithful forever. That nothing happens that does not pass through your hands. That you do all things for a reason, for our good, the good of those who love you, and for your glory. So may we glorify your name, our lives, our words, and our actions. We love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated just for a moment. So Nathan did most of the announcements already, so I'll just go over a couple, but it really is important. You, church family, um, have been a family to my family for over 30 years. I want to thank you for that, and and know that God wants that for you, for this to be your family as well, and a great way to do that, an opportunity to be more um, plugged in in that way, our growth groups. So get connected. There's uh, many of them going on around town. If you don't know which one is a good fit for you, call the church office, ask for me. I will, uh, I will help you get plugged in. Um, there, but there are many of them going on. You can go to the church website, countryoaks.org, and click on the growth groups. You'll find uh, those that are available to help you, um, at least maybe in the initial planning, the initial look. Junior high and high school Bible study is back in full swing. Awana is back here on campus. Um, we have a college growth group going on. If you're a college age, um, maybe you're not going to college right now, but, uh, or you are home and, and are doing distance education. If you're in that 18 to 23 range, uh, we would love to have you join us at our house out in Bear Valley, Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock. Um, other things happening, um, as Nathan mentioned, we're going inside next week. That is a big announcement. Um, fellowship time at 10 o'clock. If you're a uh, traditionally come to the 1030 service, we want to ask you to come a little early so that we can interact with the earlier service people. Likewise, if you go to the first service, please be, be planning your morning around, hanging around to get to know your church family so that we can do that together. Also next week, ABFs will be meeting again. ABFs and um, uh, the adult Sunday school uh, as well as the children's Sunday school programs will be coming back online. Um, and that involves an opportunity for all of us to be involved. Um, children's ministry has several openings. Um, if you are interested in being a Sunday school teacher, I know Mike Owens needs a couple of people to fill in. Mike's over here. Kathy Turney needs a few families, uh, the, a few people to fill in and to take nursery duty. Your opportunity to sign up is down at the end here on the sign-up sheets or talk with Mike. Um, I don't see is Kathy here this morning. 
Kathy's not here this morning, but if you call, we'll get you in touch with her. But it's important that we, we grow together this way, brothers and sisters. So as we go now, let me just uh, remind us all of, of Jesus' words to us. As he says this in Matthew 28, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. God bless you, church. You're dismissed.